Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Perfect Building Maintenance, m and Bank, Customers Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Capital One Bank, Collins Building Services, Meridian Capital Group. Additional support has been provided by grants from AKA Hotel Residences Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Amarin Bank, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Chase Commercial Mortgage Lending, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Citizens Bank, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC, Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Keysight Capital Partners, Matone Group, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Ocean First Bank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, Stonehenge NYC, SVN CPEX Real Estate Services, Tierra CRG, the Meringo Family Foundation, and these friends. It's called an educated consumer is, is our best, best customer. customer. Yes, that's the title that I know my friends from the Sims family. They are a great family, a great tradition, a great history. And today I have the former president and CEO of Sims Corp, a community leader, a community activist, an author, my friend Marcy Sims, to tell the story. So. Tell me about Dad's side. You know, that small family, I think, of 14? <laughs> well, he was the youngest of 10. He was the youngest. Two of, two of the children passed an in infancy, but um, he was the youngest of 10 children, and Morris and Sophie were from Russia. When does Morris and Sophie come over? About 1903. I think uh, Sophie and Morris were uh, very well suited for each other because they kept having children. My father, who was the youngest child, had six older sisters and uh, one older brother who was 14 years older George. than him, which was George. And I think my dad said that he was really closer to George, his older brother, than with his father, who he admired and was in awe of. But he said that being a first-generation American and living in Brooklyn where he did, he said he was often embarrassed by his parents because they still spoke Yiddish, and when they, when they did speak English, it was in a very thick accent. What did uh, your dad's father do for a living with, with this large family? Well, I think he really was a, a pretty good hustler because the story goes that he started selling collars and cuffs from his apartment in Brooklyn and was very successful uh, selling not only just two people who came to the apartment, but as a traveling salesman. And in those days, I guess it was pretty hard to wash your shirt, so you would just wash the collars and cuffs. And that really lasted through up until World War II. Your dad is born when? 1926. Okay, and as you said, he's the youngest of, of the ten. entire, of 10. Yeah. Okay, and he grows in, in Brooklyn. Yes. And he attends um, Midwood, Midwood High School. Midwood, Midwood High School. Midwood High School. Yes. Um, and it's interesting because your dad in 1944 uh, was uh, selected to enter the military service, That's correct? That's correct, yes. Which we have a picture of your dad in the army over there. Yes. Where did he spend his time? Actually, he spent his time in Virginia. And he um, wanted to be an engineer there. Uh, he very much enjoyed 
um, working with equipment, particularly he used to study broadcasting. He used to study with a um, reel-to-reel -reel and practice his voice. And so he thought he would go into engineering. And one of the things, it turned out to be good fortune in the long run, that happened to him is in the engineering uh, training that he had in Virginia, he fell off a bridge and he got a concussion. And so he didn't go overseas in 1944. He stayed here. So let's talk a little bit about mom, because mom, tell me about her family and then her life. Mom had um, a younger sister. And her parents, Louis Glickman and Clara Who Glickman. Who we have a picture of, right? Yes. They came from Romania. And they originally came over as children around the same time, the turn of the century. And they had uh, relatives who lived in Philadelphia. And there, at that time, was a Romanian community, Jewish community in downtown Philadelphia. And um, that's where Louis and Clara met, and that's where they got married, and then moved to the, to the Bronx. Bronx. They moved in the Bronx. Right. So tell me about Mom, because Mom, we have a picture from Variety magazine, like 1946. That's correct. And Mom showed early promise in music. Louis, who I knew when I was a child, with someone who loved music. The ukulele. And he played the ukulele. Yes, he played the ukulele, and he could sing along. He had lots and lots of talents, uh, none of which he really used in his life other than entertaining his family, which he did. So he was not in the collars and stays business. No, no. Louis, um, that side, my mother's side of the family, Louis really didn't have a trade until the New Deal when he was um, able to sign up for training as a sheet metal worker. And his great pride was in the unions. was unions. And being part of a union was his, his great pride as, as a worker all his life. And he worked on the... Um, worked on the, the Chrysler building. The Chrysler building. That was his pride and joy. So now we have your father, who happens to be interested in broadcasting. And we have your mother, who is a singer. Yes. Okay. And so her and, uh, mother, Clara took her to auditions. At WINS. At WINS and, and, and a few other stations, too. She also, she also sang for um, uh, WMCA, uh, WINS and WMCA. But I have the pictures from WINS where she had a 15-minute program. And that's where she met Cy, who was then Seymour. And he was doing late night news reading. So they get married. When do your parents get married? They get married in 48. 1948, mm -hmm. and at that time, Sai is still trying the broadcasting world. He is, very much so. He got this great job. He was so thrilled. He used to talk about it all the time, where he was doing what he wanted, not reading the news, but play-by-play -play sports. And because it was a small Virginia station, he was able to do all of the sports, not just baseball, which was his love, because he was a catcher for years. He, he played, and he was coach of the Little League team that my three brothers were, were part of. And um, so he did baseball, basketball, and football. So what happens later on? His older brother, George, who he's, mm -hmm. we saw as a child, goes into business with? With Morris, with his, Ma father, his father, his size father. And takes this collars and cuff business that was really kind of a traveling salesman operation and turns it into a retail outlet situation. In, and lower, they, in lower Manhattan. Yes, at VC Street, uh, right across from where today is the Freedom Tower Museum, the 9-11 Museum. And Cy, when my mother became pregnant with me, said, that was the end of my career, Marcy. I, you know, it was because of you that I went into the clothing business with my older brother, George. And he was a salesman. He didn't have any part ownership of that. Right. And that was called Merns. That's correct. Right. Because the family name is Mar Marinsky. Marinsky. Yes. So like the theater. It, so they cut it down to Merns. That's correct. Okay. And your father works with his brother. Yes. And his father. Yes. And his sisters. And his sisters. Yes. In Merns, which was what? More of the men's business? It was a haberdashery. Um, and it was, the majority of the square footage was really shirts and pajamas and things. Haberdashery is what touches the skin, and clothing is what touches other fabric. So it was mostly men's haberdashery, underwear, shirts, ties, um, you know, that kind of stuff. So 
sweaters. During this period of time, you're born, plus there are five other siblings. There are mm -hmm. a total of six. Mm -hmm. And one day your father decides to go out on his own. He does. He, he, the story he shared, uh, and I remember because going to VC Street with him um, on, on those occasions where he would be uh, amenable to taking me down there, and it was really kind of fun. I love that area, that whole hustle bustle near this the Hudson before Tube. The trade center. It was before the Trade Center, right? Yeah. And it was an auction area. It was an area that sold they small still had equipment. They had peddlers on the street. That's right. It was really colorful. It was very exciting as a kid to be around that kind of energy. And um, but my dad said that he had talked to George early on, and George didn't work all that hard according to my father and my father had most of the relationships with the vendors he had the relationships with the salespeople there were a couple of men that were hired uh, who and there were only men and my aunts right we have a of picture aunts. of the uh, as we would say the syndicate of um, men's wear manufacturers and wholesalers in that that's, picture that's correct uh, there it was a very small finely controlled uh, community of men who were involved with the manufacture of, of clothing. And the Mern store continued to uh, increase the selection of merchandise that they had so that they started doing things like sport coats and pants. And uh, my father said to his older brother, you know, I really want to buy into the business because I'm spending so much time here. He also had six children and we were not very comfortable. Uh, there was a lot of scrimping and a lot of uh, going to different places for uh, sales on coupon food in various supermarkets because I'd go with my mother and we'd go one place for the peas and another place for the chopped meat because one was on sale there and the other was on sale in the other place. And my father said to his brother, I can either buy in or I'm going to leave. And his brother said, what are you crazy? I'm going to sell it to you? No. And he left. And so he, once he starts Sims he, with a friend by the name of Irving Pomerantz. Irving Pomerantz, who he met in the industry. Irving had been in the industry and was much older than Cy, probably 25 years older. And, um, or maybe more, but he was a, a, a lovely man, a, a very comical character, very loyal and sincere. And he liked Cy, and he thought Cy was going to be successful. And um, he helped Cy sign his first lease. My grandparents, who were not well off at all, the one thing they had to their name was AT&T stock that they had bought early on in their marriage. That's my mother's parents. They sold their AT&T stock, gave Cy that money. Irving kicked in money, and they signed a lease. Right, on their first door? It was Cortland Street. Right. Right near the Hudson Tubes. I want to transition your life into the business because mm. it's very important. You're the eldest of six. We have a picture of you with your five other siblings Right, over when there. I was 11, that picture okay. was, yeah. And you initially grew up where, in the Bronx? I spent the first four years in Brooklyn doing what I did best, which was running the elevator for the apartment building. Right, but you also <laughs> know at the beginning that people don't realize that you loved acting, you wanted to be an actress. I did, I did, but that didn't start till I was, uh, after I was five. I'll oh, tell okay. you when it happened, it was an epiphany. Uh, we moved to Yonkers and I, um, in meeting the neighbors, I was so excited to live in a place where you could run outside and just be outdoors. And I would run out and I'd say, hi, 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 how are you? And I wanted to meet you and my name's Marcy. And I was just so effervescent and everything. And they were like, who the hell? I mean, they're five, five and 10 years right. old. And I realized that a great skill would be acting so that I could seem indifferent instead of being this enthusiastic person that I was and still am. So that's when I first had this epiphany. It would be great to control um, how I came across. And I realized I didn't want to do that in my own life. But as I got older in junior high school and high school, I was always involved in theater. Now, <clears throat> when, how old are you when dad starts Sims? I was nine. So did you go to the store on the weekends? I did. I went to the store on the weekends if my mom didn't need me because I was really... You were the oldest sister. I was the oldest sister and the next was uh, uh, younger than me with three brothers. And the two youngest children were my sisters, Laura and Adrian. 
And so, you know, the three brothers were boys and they were not the, the roles that were expected, the jobs that you were expected to do. You know, I was expected to work with mom on the food and the vacuuming and the cleaning and mending and all that now, stuff. Now, you said that Cy enjoyed Yonkers because the trotters were nearby. That's right. Okay, so one day, Cy was lucky to win the trifecta yes. at Yonkers. <laughs> he was usually lucky. Okay. He was usually a winner. He was a good winner, a yep. good handicapper. That Cy decided that he was going to move his family from Yonkers to Bronxville. It was a beautiful, beautiful home, and it was uh, it was inhabited by the then president of Reynolds Aluminum, at, and and the, the home had been empty for about two years, and I was ecstatic again, going from a home where we had eight people using one bathroom in the morning to a home where I might share the bathroom with only one person in the morning. So it was um, it was a it was a wonderful opportunity, except that the community was very anti-Semitic at the time. And we were part of the uh, Bronxville School District. Um, I stayed there, and as a matter of fact, I have a very dear friend from that time who is now the dean of the Macaulay School at uh, Cooney, and I'm on her board, the uh, Macaulay Foundation board. But um, it was a very difficult time. And my three brothers and two sisters wound up finishing their education in the Tuckahoe School right. District. So how did you decide to go to Finch? Well, I had um, left to go to school in Pittsburgh. And while I was away, I couldn't find a doctor to deal with uh, an autoimmune disease that I have and continue to have. Uh, and uh, actually started a foundation to help people with this uh, disease. And I had to come back to New York where there were doctors that knew how to treat it. So you go to Finch. Uh, well, when I got back to New York, um, I was working at Audits and Surveys. Right. I got a job right away, and um, I, I really enjoyed it. I was working on the um, Coca-Cola uh, research campaign, where you would, this was all phone requests. You'd get a willing person on the phone, and you'd spend about 15 minutes asking these probing questions about their uh, likes and dislikes of Coca-Cola, the brand, the access, et cetera. So it was great marketing exposure for me. Um, but NYU didn't have any rooms for, even though I got in, and I did not want to go back home. Um, just a little bit too much commotion. Oh. Finch had a room, and Finch was very receptive. And this time, you never thought that you were going to go to the business. You were working. Oh, no. Right. I never you had, thought you I'd go never, into business. never thought you'd go into the business. No. So you graduate Finch, mm -hmm. and then you get involved with media? Well, not right away. Before uh, I got involved with studying media and going to graduate school, I actually went to get a degree in a burgeoning, a new field called paralegal. And I was one of the first classes that graduated from the Paralegal Institute here in New York, and I was hired by Maurice Najari. Uh, if the you remember the right. story, at that time I was transcribing these tapes that were, you know, the court had approved to overhear all of these uh, criminals. I was working on one candidate who, you know, horrible, horrible discussions of killings and everything. And the day that he came in and we were on the 57th floor of number one World Trade Center and the elevator opens up and I'm standing in a corner. I can't wait to see this guy. I figured he'd look like a monster. And there was this dapper guy in his early 40s and I went, oh my goodness, I'd actually even ask him directions. I am in the wrong Field. If this is what you have to do as a lawyer, I don't think I could tell the good guys from the bad yeah, guys. But you were paralegal. You were not. But it was the the idea was that if I liked it, I was going to go to law school. That was that was really the so idea. So then you continue at NYU. No, then I continued uh, on to Boston University, and I got into the graduate program in fine arts. In fine arts, yeah. And I graduated though with my uh, master's was eventually in uh, public relations, corporate public relations. So now it's time to get a job, kid. And I landed a super job. <laughs> I um, 
through becoming a, a, a woman in communications member and a public relations professionals of America member, I went to a conference in New York at the Sheraton Center and I met Peter Strauss. Formerly the owner of Strauss Communications and WMCA Radio. Correct. And he was a charming man and he was very brusque and he was surrounded. Anyway, he gave me his card and I wrote him a letter. And then I came in for an interview and he said he had just lost someone who was his assistant. And if I, you know, was amenable to that, it was terrific. I was able to uh, produce his radio show for a while while I was there and um, get involved with understanding broadcast unions and union contracts and scheduling. He had me working on scheduling, which later in retail became a very valuable skill. And um, he also took me to meetings where he met uh, important people and had me take notes. It was, it was great. Okay, fast forward, then you got into Cats Communication. Right, I, I, I was fired there, and being fired is a real blow. It was a real blow to me. I remember calling my dad after getting fired and saying, what do I do now? And he said, well, I think you just leave. <laughs> just walk out and we'll, you'll figure it out. And uh, it was at that time that my dad asked me to uh, do TV commercials for Sims. And uh, he had gotten into the women's business, and he said, you could do the women's ad. And, because and he was doing the men's ad. That's correct. Well, I said to him, you know, in a, a very innocent and, and perhaps naive way, I said, you know, I can't really represent Sims Clothing Store because I'm not working there, and I don't know if I want to work there. And um, he just took that. We continued to talk about business because I loved hearing about uh, his, his business. I always enjoyed that. So let's that. talk shortly about the growth of Sims. You joined Sims in what year? 78. So it's 1978. During that period of time, the company buys Sulka. No, 81 we bought Sulka. Right, 78 yeah. later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You buy Sulka, which was the high priced, quality haberdashery. Bespoke, everything yeah, was everything hand bespoke. finished. The most and luxurious fabrics. Sims grows. You open up different locations. Well, we went from a city store to a suburban store. Correct. You opened up East Elmsford. We Elmsford was opened in December of '78. Uh, I joined the company in January of '78 um, to as a three-month contract worker, and my job was the media plan and helping to set up a store, the first store that my father opened outside of the New York area of any significance, which was in Falls Church, Virginia. And it was a, a really fascinating location. He took me to see the site. Um, it was where, ex where uh, Route 450 crossed Route 7. So you'd get not only the Northern Virginia, but all the Washington crowd. And he was v very much into suits at that point. The company goes public when? 83. So it's 1983, the company is going public. And you said to me, Bear Stearns takes you public? Bear Stearns and Rothschild. Okay. During that period of time, you become president of the company? After we went public. It F was actually during the road show when we met with Bear Stearns. You know, as an, as an entrepreneurial company, what was so exciting about it is you could do whatever needed to be done. So anytime there was something to be done and there wasn't an expert or someone didn't know how to do it, you could teach yourself and do it, which was fabulous. But once you go into the more, uh, you know, the growth period of the business and you go into Wall Street and you want to explain what is your business about to investors, there has to be an organizational chart. Right. There has to be job descriptions. And it was really not only with my father's blessing, but with the um, anointment, if you will, from the Bear Stearns and Rothschild people that I was made president. During that period of time you wrote this book? I didn't start the book until 88. 88. It was after I had... 93 came out, 92, 93. Yes, exactly. And I was asked to give a talk on family business. <clears throat> and this was in 1987. And my father and his then wife was in the audience. And my father came up afterwards. And I was most nervous about my father hearing me talk about family business. And he said, that was great. And I was so relieved. But the reaction to me talking about family business was so many people saying, you know, can you help me with this? Can you suggest what I can do about this? And I, I was like an instant 
a family business person. And you were with Sims until 2012? Correct. Okay. Since 2012, you've been, you're on the board of Benco, a dental company. Yes, a you're family business. Family business. Third right, generation. Right Aid, which was a family business that's, also. That's right. Okay. Yeah. You're very involved with the community and women's rights and liberal. You were the Carol Maloney. Tell Carolyn Maloney, yes. Carolyn, who I've known for many years. My brother Stephen actually introduced me when she first ran for Congress. And uh, I was at the uh, funeral for Mickey Siebert, who was the first woman to hold a seat in the New York Stock Exchange, a Jewish woman from the South. Right. Fabulous, fabulous woman. And it was her um, funeral, and, and uh, Carolyn Maloney was there, and she said, what are you doing? And I told her, and she said, I have something for you. Okay, and Gloria And she Steiner. got me. And, and I met Gloria, actually, in uh, working with the ERA Coalition and the Fund for Women's Equality, which uh, I chaired and now co-chair for, um, for, for the past few years. So I would say, you know, the Sims story is a great story, and Marcy Sims is a continuation of the story. You've been involved with many charities. I, yes. I met you through State of Israel Bonds. You've been involved with Simon Wiesenthal Institute. That's You're right. the president and CEO of the Asai Sims Foundation, who's one of the beneficiaries is Yeshiva University, the Sims School of Business. And it's a great honor to have you, and thanks for being here. My pleasure, Michael. Great to see you. Thank you.